During the winter of early 1941, the German battleships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau do untold damage to the Atlantic convoys that are bringing vital food, fuel and war material to Britain. They sink 115,000 tonnes of shipping, 22 vessels, the highest success rate that the Kriegsmarine surface fleet achieve at any time in the war. Britain's war supply lifeline is under serious threat. After their highly successful hunt, the two battleships returned to the port of Brest for overhaul and repairs in March 1941. A photo reconnaissance Spitfire spots them six days later. Scharnhorst requires at least ten weeks of repairs to her boilers, while Gneisenau only needs minor work before she'll be able to put to sea to devastate the Atlantic convoys again. On the 30th of March, RAF Bomber Command send 109 light and medium bombers with armour-piercing bomb loadouts to attack the ships in harbour, with no success. The German command have mandated that all maintenance on the ships is carried out by German workers so as to minimise the risk that the French resistance can sabotage progress or report valuable intelligence to the British. With repairs complete, Gneisenau moves out of dry dock to an exposed mooring in the bay on the 5th of April. She could slip away into the Atlantic at any moment. The next day, four Coastal Command Beauforts launch torpedo attacks on Gneisenau. The first three can't break through the heavy anti-aircraft fire defending the battleship, but the fourth, piloted by Flying Officer Kenneth Campbell, presses on and releases his torpedo. It explodes against Gneisenau. Campbell's aircraft takes a direct hit from flak and crashes into the sea, instantly killing the four-man crew. Gneisenau's starboard propeller and shaft have been disabled. She begins to take on water, but a salvage boat arrives quickly to stabilise the ship. Campbell's attack has taken Gneisenau out of action for a further six months. He's posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. The night attacks by Bomber Command continue on the port for several months. The Germans rapidly enforce their anti-aircraft defences and install a smokescreen system to cloak the aiming points when raids are detected. However, Gneisenau takes damaging hits. In June, the cruiser Prinz Eugen arrives in Brest after escorting the battleship Bismarck on its ill-fated sortie into the Atlantic, and is damaged by RAF bombing. In July, with repairs complete, Scharnhorst leaves Brest to exercise near La Palisse. Worried about a breakout into the Atlantic, Bomber Command send 21 Stirlings and Halifaxes to attack the ship, scoring several direct hits. Scharnhorst limps back to dry dock in Brest. Between July and December 1941, 1,000 further bombing sorties are conducted against Brest, with further success against the port infrastructure and damage inflicted on the ships. Owing to successful air attacks, all three ships have been prevented from becoming operational again in 1941. The ability of the Royal Navy to track down and hunt Bismarck in the Atlantic has worried the senior German leadership, along with the obvious vulnerability to air attack while in Brest. It is decided that the use of battleships for commerce raiding should be suspended. It's not worth the risk. There's a wider strategic problem. Britain is using commandos to raid targets along the German-occupied Norwegian coast. The High Command fear that these are a prelude to a seaborne British invasion of Norway. Commander-in-Chief of the Kriegsmarine, Admiral Raider, is instructed to bring the three capital ships at Brest back to Germany for redeployment. Taking the wide route around the British Isles would take the ships dangerously close to the massive British fleet at Scarpa Flow, which would have time to track the vessels and prepare for the interception. The second option would be a surprise fast dash up the English Channel, in range of British bombers, coastal guns and lighter navy vessels that could be scrambled in time. Because the hard-hitting Royal Navy home fleet is in Scarpa Flow in Scotland, in anticipation of a potential sortie by the modern German battleship Tirpitz from Norway, the Channel Dash plan is chosen. On the night of the 11th of February 1942, the three ships Gneisenau, Scharnhorst and Prince Eugen finally sail out of Brest with an escort of six destroyers and turn north towards the Channel. They narrowly avoid detection from a recon flight of RAF Hudson's, the Bomber Command raid on Brest planned for that night doesn't spot that the vessels have left because the defensive smokescreen has been deployed. 26 German E-boat fast attack craft will join the fleet early the following morning to escort. In the week leading to the sortie, 
British codebreakers at Bletchley Park have intercepted communications about the deployment of the six destroyers to Brest. The Admiralty believe this could be a prelude to a sortie, and prepare for a possible dash up the channel by priming anti-surface vessel Hudson aircraft, Swordfish and Beaufort torpedo aircraft, motor torpedo boats and squadrons of fighter and bomber command to be prepared to attack the ships at short notice if spotted. The response plan is named Operation Fuller. A brilliant plan has been put in action by the German signal service to degrade the British coastal radar that would have been used to spot the ships in the channel. Over a number of weeks, weak transmissions have been made at sunrise every morning from German stations in France using the same frequencies as the British radar stations, degrading and confusing their radar return signals. This has created the illusion that the radar degradation is due to morning atmospheric interference and doesn't raise suspicion. The German vessels pass Cherbourg as the sun rises the following morning and rendezvous with the first of the 250 Luftwaffe fighters that will provide air cover throughout the day. Admiral Otto Siliax has no choice but to sail his fleet through a newly laid minefield. RAF Spitfires are beginning their morning reconnaissance flights over the channel. One spots a number of e-boats leaving Boulogne in a southwesterly direction. Another spots faraway Luftwaffe aircraft circling a point just off the French coast, but doesn't spot any shipping. The radar station at Beachy Head reports the so-called atmospheric interference, but can just about make out the aircraft circling something below. They aren't sure, but report potential naval activity. Fighter Command initially believe that there is a search and rescue operation underway, but the plots seem to be gradually moving east along the coast. Sensing something unusual, Fighter Command deploy two further Spitfires to the area to investigate. The February weather of rain, low cloud and wind closes in, but the pilots spot the escorting e-boats and sight a fleet of larger vessels further away through the rain. Because they're on a recon mission, their orders are for radio silence in the air, so as not to give away to the enemy that they've been spotted. They turn back to their base at Biggin Hill. Another pair of Spitfires descend out of the cloud directly over the fleet. Anti-aircraft fire flashes up at them as they realise they've discovered German capital ships. They spot 109s above and climb back into the safety of cloud. The time is 10.40. When the four Spitfires eventually land at their bases and report their sightings, 31 minutes have passed and the fleet has progressed another 17 miles up the channel. A message is transmitted along the south coast of England. The German ships are out. The Operation Fuller units are mobilised. Swordfish and motor torpedo boats from Dover prepare to launch attacks on the fleet and Beauforts begin to move forward to bases in Kent to be able to support later in the day. The coastal gun battery at South Foreland near Dover is the first to open fire with its 9-inch guns at 12.19. The K-type fire control radar used to direct the fire of guns is brand new and the gunners here are still in training. The mist and low cloud obscures the enemy, and the splashes of the shells in the water are not detectable on radar. They're unable to correct their fire for wind. The first five motor torpedo boats, with motor gunboat escort, come within firing range at 12.33, but can't penetrate the outer screen of e-boats and destroyers that are now opening fire on them. They have no choice but to launch their torpedoes from long range at the capital ships within the screen all torpedoes miss. While the enemy fleet performs evasive manoeuvres, one torpedo boat moves in for a closer shot, but also misses. Shortly after, Lieutenant Commander Esmond leads his flight of six swordfish of 825 Naval Air Squadron towards the German fleet with ten Spitfires from 72 Squadron. Esmond and his squadron had performed the torpedo attack against Bismarck, disabling its rudder the year before and will now face down Scharnhorst and Gneisenau in the channel. Knowing the odds of the six aircraft making it through the fleet's anti-aircraft fire alive is slim, the final decision on whether to commit to the attack has been left to Esmond himself. He chooses to go. Three further squadrons of Spitfires are supposed to be with them to draw some fire away from the swordfish, but the weather and bad timing has prevented the rendezvous. German 109 and 190 fighters drop from the clouds to attack and are chased off by the 10 Spitfires. 
The now alone swordfish dropped to 50 feet off the waves and pushed through the heavy anti-aircraft fire at a hopelessly slow 85 knots. More 109s appear and tear into the old bombers. An anti-aircraft shell hits Esmond's aircraft and crashes into the sea, killing him instantly. Two torpedoes are definitely released in the attack and miss. All six swordfish are shot down on the run-in, with only five of the 18 crew members surviving. Esmond is awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross. Vice Admiral Celiax would later describe the attack on his fleet by the swordfish crews as a mothball attack of a handful of ancient planes piloted by men whose bravery surpasses any other action by either side that day. 20 minutes later, a further three torpedo boats from Ramsgate attempt to attack the fleet but are unable to penetrate the e-boat screen in the still deteriorating weather. A little while after, Scharnhorst hits a mine dropped by the RAF sometime previously and is forced to stop while the rest of the fleet carries on. Vice Admiral Celiax is forced to transfer to a nearby destroyer to continue commanding the fleet still underway. Alone, the crew desperately work to repair the damage hoping that they aren't spotted by British aircraft. 45 minutes later, her engines come back to life and she sets off to try to catch up with the rest of the fleet. Not knowing that Scharnhorst is alone and vulnerable, Coastal Command Beauforts attack the main fleet to the northeast with torpedoes. Five elderly First World War Royal Navy destroyers also close in. They've been diverted from gunnery exercises in the North Sea at last minute and use onboard radar to track the fleet through the mist. They speed ahead and turn in to make their torpedo attack. As the destroyers approach their torpedo launch points, 73 aircraft of Bomber Command drop out of the cloud to join the attack. The Stirlings, Halifaxes, Wellingtons, Hamptons, Blenheims and Manchesters are the first of the three mixed aircraft type waves of bombers to attack the German fleet throughout the afternoon and evening. Some German fighters engage. With the aircraft releasing their ordnance overhead, the destroyers move in. All guns in the German fleet open fire on them, and they zigzag to avoid the incoming salvos. With shells falling on all sides danger close, HMS Campbell and Vivacious fire their torpedoes and turn away. Worcester continues to close in, and as she makes her turn to launch her torpedoes, she's hit by multiple heavy shells. She stops. Mackay and Whitshed close in on Prince Eugen and also fire off their munitions. Performing violent evasive manoeuvres, the German vessels avoid all incoming torpedoes. Not hanging around to engage the stricken HMS Worcester, they continue their dash for home. Campbell and Vivacious stop to help Worcester and her fires are brought under control. Miraculously, she's able to limp home. Over the next two hours, a further two waves of bombers totaling 169 attack Gneisenau and Scharnhorst. The cloud base is now down to 600 feet, and the terrible visibility is making bombing difficult. The formation breaks up into single aircraft flying around to find the ships and get a good unhindered bomb run. It is no surprise that no hits are scored. In the evening, both Scharnhorst and Gneisenau hit mines but the damage is contained under the cover of darkness. Gneisenau and Prinz Eugen arrive together at the German port of Brunsbüttel at the sunrise the following morning. Scharnhorst arrives at Wilhelmshaven in the mid-morning. Vice Admiral Celiax is the first commander in 300 years to lead a hostile surface battle fleet through the English Channel. The failure to enforce the blockade in her own channel is a humiliation for Britain, and the press label it a fiasco. The integrated command and control chain between Navy and Air Force has shown to be inadequate. The failure of Bomber Command to land any hits on moving naval targets and the failure of Coastal Command and the Royal Navy to land any torpedo hits is embarrassing. Britain's naval power for now still relies on its much dominant home fleet in Scarpa Flow. Two weeks later, Gneisenau is bombed by the RAF in dry dock and takes unsustainable damage. She never sails again. The Royal Navy sinks Scharnhorst at the Battle of North Cape in late 1943.